What could that possibly be about? We're going to talk about some experiments that were done, and these are all, this is all going to refer to several um, real world experiments. The general subject's a, a false backward causality, and what we're really doing is manipulating uncertainty within a probabilistic virtual reality. Originally, this experiment was done, oh, probably decades ago, two, two decades ago. It was done in Israel, and it was done with hospital data. They collected a lot of old hospital data, and the emphasis on the old. Some was, you know, a decade old. People had been in a hospital, had been out for 10 years. And they collected all this data of how long the people stayed in the hospital. The idea was that the longer they stayed, probably the sicker they were. So the shorter they stayed, the less serious the problem was. So they had all this hospital data over a decade, or maybe even two decades, and they broke the hospital data into various groups, randomly broke it into various groups. And then some of the, some of the groups were control groups, and other groups, they were going to use their intent in order to aid and, and uh, a positive intent toward the health of the people belonging to these records. It was a lot of name. It was like a name and a, how long did they stay in the hospital, sort of thing. Okay. They did that, and much to everybody's surprise, the groups for which they had positive intent for better health had statistically significant shorter hospital stays. Now this data is old data. It wasn't new data. It wasn't people who were in the hospital who then got out in less time because of this positive intent for their health. This is people who had already been and gone from the hospital years ago. They took pieces of the data, used their positive intent for better health for these people, and found out that those people that they used their intent for had shorter hospital stays that was statistically significant. Looks like backward causality. They're giving better health to people who were in the hospital years ago, right? So what's going on there? What's the, what happened? And they repeated this experiment, and they repeated it you know, three or four times to where they were convinced that they had real effects. These weren't just, you know, it wasn't just uh, good guessing or, or good luck or something like that. And they did do good statistics and they did have statistical significance and it was repeatable. And then some other people tried to repeat it and it was still repeatable. So I'm going to just, that was the kind of the root of where I take this. Now I'm just going to take this and make it bigger and easier to understand what was going on. So, so I'm going to say that we have 10,000 of these historical records. And later we're going to let historical records be random numbers. And there are other researchers have done the same problem with random numbers and they've done it with uh, um, random decays from a radioactive source. They have a decay, a radioactive source, and they'll put a Geiger counter, which is a, something that gives an electrical impulse if a, if a particle hits it, on either side of the source. Now the source may send a particle off on any random direction, but every once in a while it'll hit this Geiger counter and it'll count one, and it'll hit this one and it'll give a count, and if another one hits that one, then it'll count two, and each Geiger counter just keeps track of how many counts it got from that source, since the source is random, you should have about equal numbers in both. It's another way of doing random number generation, if you like, it's a little different. So this experiment has been done in many modalities, many ways. The hospital data was just the first that got people thinking about what's going on here. So first we'll talk about the hospital data. Okay, so if we had these historical records, and let's say we have 10,000 of them, so here's a thousand, and I have five here and five down on this row, so that's the 10,000. 
And then I break them up into two groups of 500. So I have 20 groups of 500 each. And if we take the groups in this 500 and say, well, let, let's not bother with that one. Let's try to help these people be healthier. And we do this through all these groups. We repeat the experiment 10 times. Okay, then what they found is that with statistical significance, they could, the control group consistently had shorter hospital stays. If we do this with random numbers, we have uh, 10 collections of random numbers, you know, and this one we just leave them random, we don't do anything with it, and this one we try to let, raise it or lower it. You see, it's the same problem. Or if we do it with the Geiger counters, and we have lots of different experiments with the Geiger counter and the source, and we break them into groups, and here we try to make the counts go higher or lower. So you see, it's all the same kind of an experiment. And this is an easy experiment to do on your own if you get a random number generator from Pair Labs. Well, Pair Labs doesn't exist anymore. Uh, recently, they uh, folded up and turned into another corporation whose name I can't repeat right now. I don't remember it, but you'll look them up. If you Google Pair Labs, you'll find out who they turned into. And they sell random number generators, and you can generate random numbers and do this experiment yourself at home. It's an easy, that's why one of the reasons I bring this up. So even though it was patient records, which is hard for you to do at home, you can actually do this experiment on your own at home. Well, what was going on there with these hospital records? How did that work? Well, it's very much like the double slit experiment. Remember we said that the double slit experiment is a general, it's general rules. Quantum mechanics is a general rule, it applies to everything. They took this hospital data. Nobody had ever collected this hospital data before. They just went into records. You know, they were all in various records in the hospital. They pulled them all out, and they had this big database. <coughs> there was a lot of uncertainty in that database as to what that database would see. Nobody knew what average hospital stays would be or anything else. It was just data that had never been looked at before. So what they were able to do is within the uncertainty of that data, they were able to modify it. So they weren't changing the health of people who had gotten out of the hospital a long time ago. They were modifying the data that those people had generated, but was uncertain. It was the uncertainty within the data that was able to be moved. Again, only within the natural uncertainty of the data, but in this case, the natural uncertainty was fairly broad because it was just unknown data. Nobody had ever looked at before. So this is another example of you know, how intent modifies future probability. If you have an intent on this particular block of data, you can bias it a little bit within the normal uncertainty that goes with that data. So it didn't matter that this was data from a past event. It doesn't matter that the random number generator that generated all these numbers was done last year. It doesn't matter that the, you know, that the Geiger counters in a source was a decade ago, and you have all the data, you can still modify reality within the uncertainty, the natural uncertainty, with intent. And that's what they did. So now we can, we can look at some other things that could be done with this that are interesting. So we can modify this number, and if we do, and we change it just a little bit, so now the people here got out of the hospital, you know, maybe half a day earlier than the others on an average. But these people got out a half a day earlier and so did these and, and so did those and so did those. So a half, when I say half a day early, I mean a half a day earlier than the ones that were the control group. Okay. So we didn't necessarily get all 10. Sometimes it didn't work out that way because sometimes just naturally, this one was just naturally low and this one was just naturally high and you just brought them down like this maybe with your intent, but still didn't make the other one low, you see. So it doesn't necessarily work all the time to do what you want to do, but it works enough that you can show statistical significance. And the probability of getting, say, eight out of those 10 is the probability of getting eight heads out of 10 coin flips. That's pretty significant. That's not something you would just do randomly. It's got a pretty good significance with it. <clears throat> so what if we took the 10,000 and we took an average of it. 
before we did anything else, we've got this 10,000 data, and we say, all right, what's the average hospital stay here? And then we broke it up randomly into all these things. Okay, what happens now? Will it work? Yes, but with constraints. What happens now, if we know what this average is, is that yes, we can lower this, and we can lower that, but if we do, the whole result, when we're done, still has to equal this, whereas before we didn't have that constraint. In other words, the average of all of these afterwards has to be the same as the average we started with because now we've created a constraint. Before there were no constraints except the natural uncertainty. Now there's the natural uncertainty and that the ensemble of the statistical sample here has to have an average that we figured ahead of time. We've added a constraint. So we're not gonna, it's not gonna be as easy as before. We've additional constraint. What happens if we take this group and before we try to change either one of these, we do an average of this 1,000. What's the average hospital stay of that 1,000? Well, oh, oh, we, can we still do it? We can, but you know, if we lower that, we'll have to raise this by the same amount because the average has to be the same. So if we decide to, to lower this average of the random numbers or hospital stays or whatever counts in a Geiger counter, then the counts that are in this bin are gonna have to go up by the same amount. Could we do that? Yeah, we could do that. And if we decided to raise this one, that would have to go down by the same amount. But we could only move them up and down again within the natural uncertainty of you know, it goes with the problem, but we could. But what happens if we do, if we know two of them, if we know, say, this one, and we do this average before we start, now can we do anything? No, there's no uncertainty anymore, you see? We can't change this, because if we did, that would change, and we already know that. So now we're dead in the water, all the intent in the world isn't going to help us here. We know this average, we know this average, and that average is just gonna be whatever it is and, and we cannot change that because now the probability of what this average is is that probability function went like this, that, that real steep curve over that particular answer and it's not gonna be able to be changed. So see, we can add and we can change constraints here as we look at this problem and get different answers. So we could uh, say take the average, you know, we could take the average of, of half of this or we could do other things and it just adds constraints. You can look at, you can slice and dice this problem a lot of different ways and all you're doing is adding constraints. This would be a good problem for someone to do. I don't know that this has ever been done like this so that you add, take away, you know, and add constraints. That would be an interesting you know, an ex interesting exercise to do, something that's uh, easily falsifiable and easy, an easy thing to do. So that's a, an interesting problem. Um, if we, you know, if we took uh, all of these, all these groups of 1,000 and averaged each group, you know, then we would know that would basically give us this, you see, so it gives us several constraints. It gives us the total constraint and it gives us the constraint of how these two could be changed. So there's different ways. There's probably four or five different ways you can shuffle constraints here that will fix the way your outcome has to be. And that would be a good test, right, of this, of this theory. So that was kind of an interesting, interesting thing to do if you think uh, of it, but we, they came up with this idea of a backward causality. We are causing things to happen in the past. Just like with that delayed eraser experiment I told you, it looked like because you erase it in the past, I mean you, you erase it in the future, you erase it later, it looks like you're causing something to change. Or it looks like in the uh, delayed eraser uh, that was more complicated, it looks like that you have a result and then later you decide to collect the, the which way data or not and somehow that result changes. It's going back in time to change it, see, more backward causality. 
but it's not really backward causality. Backward causality doesn't exist. That's illogical. That's one of the big you know, paradoxes in physics. How, how do we explain this? How do we explain a particle going through two slits at the same time? How do we explain this backward causality? There is no backward causality. Things are probable until they're measured. This data is unknown. It's got uncertainty, and within uncertainty, we can change it. It doesn't matter that it's old, you see. Now, what about a, an erasure experiment? If we got all this data, and we took these numbers, and we, we, averaged, we took the average of the whole, and that would give us a constraint, right? Now we can only change these in such a way that we end up with that, that average, because that's already been given now. So then, let's say we do that one day, we get all the data, we take the average of the ensemble before we break it up into pieces, and then we lose it. The building burns down, and all the data, you know, the result and the average, and nobody can remember it because it was just done in the computer, and we lose it. Are there constraints on this now? Nope, constraints are gone. See, so this is the same as the double slit experiment. Delayed eraser, all the, all the things the double slit does, real life does. We just don't notice it. You see, because there's always plausible deniability, because it always takes place within the uncertainty that's natural to the system. That's high uncertainty. So this life is very strange life we live in this virtual reality. It's got a lot of odd things about it. And some of those odd things you can actually sit and test and see how, they, see how those constraints change based on information. See, again, the key here is information and uncertainty. Those are the key elements. Yes, it takes a consciousness to require data from the server, from the computer, but then that data gets modified according to the probabilities that are represented at the time. All right. So that's just another example of that. There's another uh, example out on the internet. You've, you may have watched this or not. He's not quite as famous as Dr. Emoto is with these freezing ice crystals, but fairly famous, been out on YouTube for a long time. And that's a physicist doctor, I think it's Edward Teller, who uh, does an experiment where he takes a beaker of water out of, out of the spigot, and he measures that with pH. And it's a fairly sensitive pH meter, so he measures the glass of water, and you know, it's about seven. It's, it's fairly neutral, as water usually is, out of a spigot. So he records that measurement, <clears throat> and then he has someone use their intent to either raise or lower the pH of the water. And he'll give them five minutes to you know, work on that, and then he'll measure the pH of the water again. And then he'll give them some time to work on, say, raising it some more, and they'll measure the pH again. And he has successfully had that pH go up a whole level, like from, you know, seven to eight, or down, I guess, or, or from seven to six, more acid or more base, either one. <clears throat> now, a whole unit of pH is a lot, a change in pH. You know, that scale is, is, every number is a big jump. And he's had it move more than a whole digit in pH. I don't know what his maximum is, maybe it even moved to two numbers, but it was quite a bit, making the water more acid or more base. And, of course, nobody has a clue how that could possibly happen. You know, that's just impossible. <clears throat> what happens is, excuse me, <clears throat> what happens is that the pH of water has a natural uncertainty. There's, you have water, H2O, and base, or little OH minus molecules, make it base, and little H plus molecules make it acid. And you have water that is combining and, and uncombining. You know, the water's falling apart. You're getting OHs are created. You're getting H pluses. You have H pluses and OHs coming together to make H2O. So water has this, you know, recombination going on on it all the time at a very small level. So the pH of water, if you just looked at it at a microscopic level, the pH of water wouldn't just be a constant. It would be a 
you know, it looked like that. The curve would be jumping up and down, higher, lower, depending on how these atoms or molecules are pulling apart and recombining. And it would even be different in different parts of the water. You know, this part of water would be a little more acid and that part of the water would be a little more base. I mean, you've got all these natural fluctuations at that molecular level going on inside this glass of water. So there's uncertainty there exactly what that pH is. It's changing all around. Well, within that uncertainty, you can bias it a little. You can create water that's just a little more acid or a little more base by shifting the pH within its range of natural uncertainty. And then you can shift it a little more. And then you can shift it a little more. And if you keep doing that, eventually, your water is really base or really acid because you've taken the natural uncertainty in what it is, natural variation, and you've just stepped it up. You see? So that's how that works. It's just manipulating intent, modifying future probability within natural uncertainty. So that's an explanation of how that sort of an experiment works. And if you haven't seen that, you can probably find it on, on YouTube. It's, it's been out there a pretty long time. So you see, in doing that, there's no conflict with history, you know, history. Things can fluctuate up a little bit. You know, random numbers can be a little high instead of a little low on their average. It's just, that's natural. You're not conflicting with any rules. And there's no historical problem. The data was unknown. Nobody knew what the data was like, so there's no break in history. And as long as you have those conditions, you have this plausible deniability. You meet the psi uncertainty requirements. Your intent can change the problem. So see how you are a co-creator. You are part of the creation process in this virtual reality. That's why this world looks like us. That's why our institutions and our cultures reflect us. We live in a violent, crazy place because we're violent, crazy beings. We create this with our intent. And that's why there's the difference between the hard sciences and the soft sciences and consciousness science, because the hard sciences only deal with things with the uncertainty is very tiny. You know, if, it, if it doesn't have a real tiny uncertainty, then it's not hard science. Soft sciences deal with stuff that's uncertain. So in the soft sciences, we find out that you have a classroom full of children, you randomly divide them up, and you take these children, put in this class, and you tell the teacher, these are all the smart children. These are the advanced children, and we're going to give you the advanced kids. And you tell the other teacher, these are all the not-so-smart children. They don't function very well. We're going to give those to you. And what do you find out at the end? The smart children are doing much better, have better test scores. And the not-so-smart children aren't doing as well, yet they were just randomly selected from a group of children. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about children and what they might learn and what they might be. A lot of uncertainty how that outcome comes out, and if the teacher is convinced that he's got the smart ones, he'll do better. And then you can make that experiment even more strong if you tell the children you're the smart children and tell those children you're the not-so-smart children because now you not only have the teacher's intent, but you have the children's intent, and you can create a whole bunch of not-so-smart children and a whole bunch of smart children just by how you treat them, what you think about them, what you expect of them, you see? Same with all um, well, the placebo effects like that. You know, doctors who have good bedside manner, which means they spend the time to talk to their patients, they spend the time to you know, treat them like important, significant human beings rather than a piece of meat you know, coming by that they're to, you know, to do some operation on or something, then those doctors are more successful. Their patients generally get better and are healthier than the doctor who treats it like it's, you know, just a, just a job and you don't really care about the people, you're just doing your job, here's a pill, there's a pill, you know, go take it, good luck. Those patients don't do so well. So our reality is a lot more flexible than most of us think. All right. Um, so information can be, can come in and can go out. 
We can, we can destroy it or not. Okay, next slide. I've talked a lot about natural uncertainty, so I just wanted to just show you an example. This is just an example if you have random numbers. And this is how many random numbers, or this is the error in the average. I mean, they got a bunch of random numbers, and this is n, how many? So here I have zero random numbers. Here I have one, two, three, four, you know, maybe this is 1,000 or 10,000. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's a lot more random numbers. And as you have more and more random numbers to take the average of, then the uncertainty on that average gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it looks something like this. So here I only have three random numbers, right, between zero and one. Well, the average of those three numbers could be eight, or could be two, or could be almost anything in between, only three random numbers. So we have a lot of, of error here between the eight and the 0.5, which is the right answer. The theoretically right answer is 0.5. So the difference between 8 and, I mean, 0.8 and 0.5, you see, is a big error. You go out here where now you have 10,000 random numbers or a million random numbers, and the error, natural error, is very, very small. So this is just a kind of a graphic look at what I mean by natural uncertainty of the, of the problem. And intent can only modify within the error. So people who are doing experiments want to do a whole lot of numbers because that makes very concise data. It's not so much just random, not so much randomness in the average, but they find out they can only make tiny little differences. In here, they can make much bigger differences, but it looks like it could just be luck because that, that jumps around, you see? See how that plausible deniability gets you? Whichever end of the scale here, you can say, oh, yeah, I had a big difference. I changed, you know, the average changed a lot. Well, but it doesn't mean anything because you only have a few numbers. So that could just be luck, plausible deniability. And out here, you can only change it. Yeah, okay, you can change it, but it's only in the fifth decimal place. That's the way it works. Let's do another one. All right, I'm going to go over just some results that we've got so far. Just to kind of, I'm, I'm going to wind up here by lunchtime, which isn't that far away. And then uh, when we come back, it's going to be all of the, the more fun uh, experiential stuff after, after lunch. And then we'll have some good Q&A after that. Okay, so what have we, what have we done? Um, you know, the results so far of this virtual reality that I've been talking to you about and consciousness and consciousness being what's real and everything else being a, you know, a part of this consciousness system. It tells us a lot of things about philosophy. You know, the Buddha says that this is all illusion. You know, and I say this is all virtual. Sounds pretty much the same thing, doesn't it? And the Buddha says, we're all one. And I say, we're all one. We're all part of the larger consciousness system. Uh, and so on it goes. Those of you who have uh, studied philosophy, you'll see that a lot of the fundamentals that we know in philosophy, a lot of the, the wisdom that we've gained through the last 4,000 years falls out of this as well. It's not just the physics and it's not just you know, the science, but philosophy falls out of this. Okay, the results that physics and metaphysics becomes part of one logical theory and are thus unified. Philosophy and theology have been integrated with science. Love and spirituality are both defined in terms of entropy, a measurable quantity. The result is that normal and paranormal are uni unified. Those experiences we just did with the uh, reverse causality with the uh, medical records, that's paranormal. Can't be explained in normal ways, but see, under a bigger picture, it's just the way the world works. It's perfectly uh, normal. The result is we've derived a fundamental purpose of existence in general and purpose of our existence in particular. That's to evolve toward lower entropy states, become love. The result is that time, relativity, quantum mechanics, 
mass, charge, all of the things that are mysteries and paradoxes have been derived from one overarching fundamental theory with just two assumptions, much like biology. The measurement problem and the invariant velocity of light problem, those were two intractable little toe problems. They've been solved. Quantum mechanics and relativity now are seen as both subsets under one overarching set of understandings. Uh, you know, time, mass, space, charge, gravity, spin, all those are now accounted for. We understand where they come from. They're part of the rule set. They just are, and that's okay. Additionally, appearance of backward causality, research at Pair Labs, the work that uh, you know, Dr. Emoto and Edward Teller do, all of those now have reasons of why they act that way. They become rational. Synchronicity in mind, next slide. Matter, scientific anomalies have been explained, placebo effect, um, lowering entropy, information available to the uh, evolving entity. One of the things I'll talk about here that I haven't talked about, and that's what I'll just call the God thing, okay? This has a lot to say also about theology. Let's think about that larger consciousness system. It's a natural system. It's a finite system. It's not a perfect system. It has rules have to have rules. If you've got structure and order, you got to have rules or you, know, you don't have structure and order. So it's a ruled, structured, aware, conscious system. And we are all parts of it. You might say we, now I'm saying we, not, not our body, we, but we as consciousness. You might say we're made in the image of that larger conscious system, because we're just a piece of it, we're a piece of consciousness, right? And it's a moral system, because morality is defined by the, things are moral if they lead toward lowering entropy, and they're immoral you know, if they lead toward raising entropy. They're good and bad is defined in terms of entropy. So it's a moral system, it's an ethical system, things that are ethical, things work better, right? They're cohesive. Uh, everything is, is more uh, connected, works well. If the unethical creates entropy, <laughs> creates problems and difficulties, creates more randomness. Okay, um, prayer works because that's just intent. That's just another metaphor for focused intent. If it comes from a being level and it has a you know, if it has some being specific, that can, that can work too. So we look at these things and we start seeing that uh, this larger consciousness system has most of the attributes that theologians would attribute to, to God or to, you know, they would fall under theology. It has a lot of those attributes. In fact, I was in Atlanta talking at a unity church to a group of people about love this is on near Valentine's Day, so I was the love speaker. And uh, I had two theologians sitting on either side of me at a table. We were doing questions, and I asked them, I said, tell me, what are the attributes of God? You know, what is it? If you had to describe what God is, you know, what are the attributes? Because these were Unity Church people who tend to be a little more open-minded or whatever, I didn't get any dogma. What I got were this list of what God is and the way God is, and every one of those was an attribute of the larger consciousness system. You see, now we're starting to see religion. Where'd that come from? Why do people have this need, this feel of, of you know, connecting to something larger than themselves? Well, because that's the way reality is, and that's what we're supposed to do, is connect to something larger than ourselves, become love, grow up, you see. And this was, a, this was a, a surprise to me because here I am, a young physicist, and I'm working on these things, right? And uh, theology is not in my worldview. And suddenly, I look at it and I can say, oh, I see where all this stuff comes from. 
these people that I didn't give much credit to actually had a pretty good handle on the truth. Pretty good handle. Now some of them got a little crazy too and went off with dogma and went off with all kinds of other things that were not helpful. That was just noise in the system. But if you look at the fundamental thread running there, you see that uh, this spirituality thing actually has roots in religion. And religions do have a certain uh, understanding that's once you get past the dogma and the creeds and, and the nonsense and the rituals and the rest of it, you've got something that's real. And we people are here to grow up. So we are given a, a drive, if you will, to better ourselves, a drive to learn, a drive to find out why, a drive to become better than we are. And everybody has that. That's kind of an innate thing that you come in with. Every human being comes in with that because that's our job. And that drive, we express in any way we can. And because we don't know, sometimes that, that expression comes out, you know, as religion, sometimes it comes out and out of body, sometimes it comes out in all sorts of things. And none of those forms make any difference. Whether you call yourself an atheist, or you call yourself, you know, religious, or you are out of body, or you're new age, it makes no difference whatsoever. Those are all just different ways of expressing this need to try to become more. So we can then start to see ourselves as really a part of something bigger. Something bigger than just us, something bigger than just human, something bigger than just this universe. And as we see ourselves with that kind of a light, it makes it easier for us to be compassionate and to be caring. Because the bigger our picture gets, the easier it is to grow up. When we have this little picture, and it's just about me, and it's just about how I'm going to get what I need, you see, then it's really hard, hard to grow up. As your picture gets bigger, the growing up gets easier. And as you grow up, your picture gets bigger. You see, they, they go hand in hand. Okay. Okay, we'll go one more slide. It should be how the world works. Okay, this is another one of those application things. Here's the way the world works. Stuff happens, and you have to deal with it. Right? Isn't that your life? Your life's always been that way. From when you were born you know, to this very moment, stuff happens and you get to deal with it. That's life in a few words. Unfortunate, we tend to focus on the front end of that. We focus almost entirely on what happens, what's going to happen, the stuff that's happening. And we put most of our energy toward manipulating and making sure that that stuff that happens is the stuff we want to happen. We work very hard at, at, that, at that control. Control the stuff that happens so it happens the way you want. You want your children to go up and go to college and become professionals and do well and be happy and you want this and you want your spouse, your husband or your wife to be in certain ways and you want your dog to stop barking at night and you want all these things that you want and you manipulate as best you can make that happen. And that's where our focus is. That's where our energy is. That's where all our time is spent on manipulating that front end, the stuff that happens. How can I get that to turn out the way I want it to be? Okay. That's unfortunate because that kind of puts us in the role of control. How can I control it? How can I do this so that that happens? You see, and that puts us in the role of manipulation. And it puts us in the role that really everything's about us. We're trying to make things come out the way we want it. So everything's for us to come out the way we want it because after all, we know best. Even though those people opposing us, they know best too. But everybody thinks they know best, so if they make it come out the way it's best, then that'll be good for everyone. What we should do is we should be focusing on our choices. We should be focusing on the choices we have to make, not on how to manipulate the future. We've just been talking about how do you manipulate the future? You do it with intent and you can change probability, but you see that's not really where the action is. 
The action is here in the middle, in the present, where we make choices. So instead of trying to manipulate the future to be the way we want it, better to focus on making good choices and about becoming love, which is about other, not about self. How can we help? How can we make good choices? How can we help other people make good choices? Not by saying you should do this or pointing out the right way, but just giving them the security and the freedom to express themselves. And if they make bad choices, then they'll learn from it. All right, we do have to make choices for children. That's true. You know, we have the responsibility to take care of them because they're not able to take care of themselves. But we're not talking about children here. We're talking about adults. And most of us feel like we really need to get those adults working the way we want them. Instead, we need to give them the, the room and the freedom to be. And we need to have the room and the freedom to be. And if we just are ourselves, if we're just honest, so what would we call that? That's called being authentic, right? If we're just authentic and we just live in the present where the action is, where the choices are, then our life starts to get a lot better. You've probably heard that from all kinds of other people if you read, you know, how you get authentic, live in the, you know, live in the moment, uh, be, be engaged, be here now, you know, and that just goes on and on and on because people have figured out that that's a better way to live your life. So focus on the how and the why and just deal with the stuff that happens in a way that you grow from it. Be aware of what your motivations are. What is your intent? If your intent is to make it come out the way you want it, you see, that's not nearly as productive an intent as your intent is to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So move from a self-focused, fear-based choices to other-focused, fo other love-based choices. Okay. So that's how the world works. We're just focused poorly. You need to, now, you, it doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't plan. Of course you have to plan. You, know? you have mortgages to pay. You have, you, know, you have automobile payments to make. You, know, you have to get to work on time. You have to make sure you pick the kids up from school. You've got responsibilities, and that's part of it. So it's not that uh, you just go float on a cloud and you know, become an airhead and drift through life. That's not what I'm saying. You have responsibilities, and that's part of your choices, is to meet those responsibilities. But I'm saying take, a, take some of your energy and time and focus and let go of control. Realize that you don't control it. The only thing you control is yourself. Stuff that happens is just stuff that happens. Think of all that stuff that happens as a challenge. And when it happens, you'll deal with it, and you'll learn from it. Where's the lesson in it? And if it's hard stuff, you know, somebody you're close to gets run over, uh, you know, you get ill, you know, maybe tough stuff that happens. You can learn from it. You can deal from all that tough stuff. If it's good things, spread the joy. You know, that's good too. So let go of control. That was a surprising thing I learned a long time ago, and that was that if you try to control everything, you realize you control nothing. It's like trying to pack too many clothes into a suitcase. You're trying to control, and you get this, you get this shirt sleeve in, and, and getting that one in, something else falls out on the other side, and you get that one in, and something else falls here, and it's this frustrating, constantly on the run, working, 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 trying to make it all work, trying to make it come out right, and it just leads to ulcers and frustration. You can't do it. The reason you can't do it is you just don't control that much of what's going on. The only thing you can control is yourself. So settle for that. And where you can control yourself is now, in the present, in the future, where you're making choices. So it's just a matter of giving attention in the right place. All right, change the slide. And why is it like that? Why is it so easy to do it wrong and so difficult to do it right? Well, that's because there's a whole lot more negative and unproductive choices then there are positive ones. You see, here's a problem. There's a thousand ways to do it wrong, but maybe only one or two ways to do it right. You see, um, it's easier to destroy than to build. 
You know, those World Trade Centers came down in, you know, half an hour. Took them years to build that. Destruction is simple. Being fearful is easier than being fearless. It's easy to be fearful. It takes courage to be fearless. Fear is reactive. Love is proactive. Love requires understanding, compassion, and caring. Fear requires nothing other than to react. Ego, you know, it's self-focused, smaller picture, is simpler than love, which is other-focused. Love, you have to understand the people. You have to be aware of their needs and ways that you can be helpful. Gimme is just about you. That's easy. Ego. Belief. Call that pseudo-knowledge. That's easier to come by than actual knowledge. Right? Pseudo-knowledge, all you have to do is decide to believe it. There it is. Actual knowledge requires experience, effort, rational thinking. Being open-minded or skeptical are both easier than being open-minded and skeptical. It's easy to be open-minded. Everything's true, everything's fine, everything's right, you know, over. Very skeptical, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing except this is true and everything else is wrong. Well, that's easy too. Being open-minded and skeptical requires effort. You know, pretending or assuming certainty, like you've got it all under control, is a lot easier than actually accepting uncertainty and dealing with things as they happen. So there's many ways to create or worsen a problem, but only a few ways to fix a problem. That's why entropy naturally grows. You know, we have this thing about second law of thermodynamics says if you don't do anything at all, entropy just keeps going on, you know, everything decays, everything falls apart. Well, that's because there's a whole lot more ways to fall apart than there are to hold everything together. So it's just the way reality works. It's just the, the nature of existence, the nature of reducing entropy. When you have something, it takes work to keep it. It takes work to improve it. And it won't improve unless you do the work. And doing the work is, has to be more than intellectually thinking it would be a good idea. Most everybody thinks it would be a really good idea if they would have a better diet, get more exercise. Great idea, right? We all think that's a great idea. But how many of us really do anything about it for very long or regularly? You see? So it takes more than realizing it's a good idea. You actually have to do it. You know? And it's the same with this. You see how easy it is. If you don't do much, if you just kind of glide along, you're going to disintegrate. You're going to deteriorate. You're going to go, you're going to de-evolve you're not going to evolve because there's a thousand ways to de-evolve, only a few ways to evolve. So that's the, unfortunately there's no way out of that problem other than to take responsibility and do it. Change. Make, make something of it. It won't happen just because you're thinking it's a good idea. It has to have commitment behind it. Okay, now I'm going to clear up a couple of things that are sometimes confusing to people. Next slide. Is this word consciousness gets confusing. Because a lot of people, when they talk about consciousness, they're not talking about a larger consciousness system. They're talking about them, their awareness in their head. That's my consciousness, you see. So I call that little c consciousness, local consciousness. That's your free will awareness unit, right, that we're talking about. That's just... Uh, kind of immersed in the experience of this avatar. All right, but that little free will, that little uh, that little C consciousness, is also a subset of the big consciousness because the little consciousness is a subset of the individuated unit of consciousness, right? And the individuated unit of consciousness is a subset of the larger conscious system. Free will awareness unit is a subset, you know, so it's a subset of a subset of the larger consciousness system. So you are consciousness, even though you didn't start with an intellectual part and you built that 
with the experience of this avatar, you're full-fledged, absolute, genuine consciousness. And you can do all the things that consciousness can do. You can create, you can change data streams, you can experience, you make choices, you have free will. You are consciousness. Okay, so that's, that uh, is the difference between this little c. When people talk about consciousness, often they're just talking about this local thing. You know, consciousness is created by your brain. Well, of course, that's not true, but they're not talking about the big consciousness. They're talking about the little consciousness. So be aware that there are, when you talk about consciousness with people, there's a couple of definitions that aren't really compatible with each other that you need to be aware of. Otherwise, you end up talking across purposes and uh, not really uh, communicating. There's another uh, a thing that goes with this. There, there are many experiments. One of the earliest one was done by a guy named LeBay in uh, the 1960s that measured a thing called the bright shaft potential. And I guess before LeBay, there, there was a, it was a couple of Germans. That's what the bright shaft sounds like a German word, right? That's, that uh, the, the study was done in Germany. And what happened is they did some research that showed that a body will start to move to respond to a response before the event happens to create the response. Okay? It's like this, so when I ring a bell, raise your right hand. So I ring the bell and everybody puts their hand up. Well, what they'll find out is just before the bell rings, the process in the body to raise the hand starts. And that's like, well, it's another one of these you know, cause us, causality getting ahead of itself, right? How can that happen? Because if the consciousness, this local little C, if that's in charge and it hadn't heard the bell yet, then what's going on here? Why is the arm starting to raise? And the conclusion was consciousness has nothing to do with it. There is no free will. This is a deterministic reality. And there we've got the proof for it. See, the arm starts to go before the consciousness is even aware of the bell. Therefore, it's not the consciousness that's telling the arm to move, it's something else. It's this deterministic program that we're all marching to like robots or like characters on a movie screen. And that was the proof that free will didn't exist. Of course, you see the, the problem with that. They're only talking about little c consciousness. They're not seeing the bigger picture where there is a larger consciousness system and that we're a part of that system and so on. That's not part of their reality. And since then, there have been other experiments like that where a random number generator picks from a group of 100 pictures. Some of the pictures are nice, some of the pictures are horrible, and they're hooked up to measure little potentials and things, and people start reacting emotionally to the horrible pictures before the random number generator even decided to pick that picture and show it. How is that possible? Well, obviously, there's no free will, you see. Well, that's not the case. Why would the body start out a little earlier than the actual thing that it's responding to? Well, there's a, a good answer to that, and that is if you've ever played these video games, you know there's something that really is annoying called video lag. Video lag is where you say, run, elf, run, and the elf just stands there like he doesn't hear you. <laughs> because it's taking too long for your signal to get through the network to the computer and for the computer to get out and actually move the elf and then get that back to you, you see? So your elf gets creamed because he just stood there when you told him to run and that's video lag. The video takes time. Well, we, as consciousness, are very fast. We compute. You know, the larger conscious system is computing billions and billions and billions of times faster than what our reality moves at. So consciousness is quick. But these bodies, these avatars, electromechanical devices, we're not quick at all. We're really slow. In order to move that arm, a lot of stuff has to happen. You know, signals have to go down nerves and then glands have to secrete things and then muscles have to wake up and contract. And I mean, you got lots of stuff and then the contracting muscle has to start. And these things start in very tiny 
and those very tiny things, when they were measuring that arm starting to move, it wasn't that the arm actually was starting to move, the arm was still still. It's just that the preparation for moving, tiny little potentials that could be measured in the tissue, you know, and that's why they weren't found until the 1960s is because we didn't have sensitive enough measuring equipment to find these tiny little things, but once we found them, then that's what this uh, uh, what was it? The bright shaft potential was about is these tiny little almost invisible things. Well, now our measuring equipment is better, and now we find lots of those things going on. And the arm hadn't moved yet, but the electrochemical processes have already started. What happens is these slow bodies create a lot of video lag for a fast consciousness and a fast computer. So what it means is that we, trying to play this game, we as consciousness trying to play a game with these avatars, our avatars are always behind us. Our reaction time is really slow. Matter of fact, it's so slow that we really couldn't do things like, I don't know, fly an airplane, uh, you know, very close, uh, fine motor, motor skills, uh, that sort of thing. You, know, you can't do really fine work when there's a video lag because you're giving commands and the thing doesn't move till later and it just doesn't work. So the system, playing all sides of the problem, remember it's a virtual bell that's going to ring that is being generated by the same computer that's moving this data around. It's a virtual computer that's creating a pseudo-random number that's going to pick the picture with the horrific scene on it that's going to make the person have an emotional reaction. So the larger consciousness system has the whole game, has all the data, and it has a future probability that goes out for years and it only needs microseconds because all these things just take place in little tiny slivers of seconds. So you see, in order for us to function, in order for us to do fine motor coordination, in order for us to drive cars, fly airplanes, uh, thread needles, do all sorts of things that we need to do, we need to get rid of the video lag, or we can't do those things. So the rule set created these avatars, but the avatars are slow. What we do is start that body moving ahead of time. So just before that bell is going to ring, that virtual bell is going to be rung by, of course, the computer is going to do that too, according to the rule set. We start at the micro level, not actually moving, but we start preparing to move so that when the bell does ring, within a reasonable amount of time, we can get our hand in the air to make it look like a smooth, coordinated motion. So that's why that works. But if you only see a little picture of little C consciousness, you come to this idea that there can't be any free will because obviously we're not in charge because our body starts going without us making any kind of decisions about it at all. Well, the larger kind of system is making decisions about it and they need this to work and be a viable place. So all of these old, these slow, clunky, electromechanical bodies of ours need a little help, need, need a little uh, advance notice so that we can do the kind of things that, that we need to be able to perform manually. So that's why that works, and that's why you'll, you'll hear people say, well, there is no free will. They've proved it. You know, they have these studies, and they show that there can't be any free will. Well, it's because they have a little picture, and in their little picture, that seems to make sense. In a bigger picture, it doesn't make sense at all. All right, next one. People often talk about brains. All right, what about this brain? We know this brain is in control. The reason we know this brain is in control it's because we can put you in an MRI and we can tickle your feet and the little foot part of the brain lights up and we can show you a sexy picture and that libido starts to light up and we can do all these things and we can see how the brain is really in control. And we have brain injuries where the brain gets damaged and we can see how it affects the body. So obviously it's the brain that's controlling the body. Well, it's a virtual brain in a virtual body. As we sit here now and none of us have our skulls open, the data stream that creates this reality for us does not have to simulate brains. 
See, it doesn't have to simulate any brains at all. It's not sending us any messages for brains. And all it has to do is send us messages that show us what our senses perceive. Our senses don't perceive any brains because they're inside skulls. That's what we believe, that they're inside skulls. Are there any brains inside those skulls? Well, only if a surgeon splits that skull open and makes a measurement, looks inside, and he sees a brain. Because that's what the rule set says it's going to be in there. That's how it evolved, right? But once that skull's sewn back up, the system isn't just emulating brains that nobody can see because it, it likes to, you know, because that makes it happy. It only emulates the data that it needs to send us. We are a piece of consciousness, getting data from a computer about a virtual reality. A computer isn't emulating brains. See, that's the, that's the bottom-up thinking. Everything's made out of particles, and all these particles have to make anything, and it's all the atoms in your brain, and they all have to be doing all this stuff. You see, it doesn't work that way. It's a probabilistic reality. We sit here and talk and think and do all the things we do because the brains represent the constraints on the consciousness. It's the constraints on the data stream. You see? So we get, we get brain damage, changes the constraints. Now we have to walk and drag one foot along because we have brain damage. We have new constraints. All virtual routers are that way. So it's not that the, that the brain is causing, the brain damage is causing you to drag the foot. The constraints, according to the rule set of that hit on the head, it's causing you to drag a foot because you have new constraints. So the brain doesn't store anything. Oh, that solves a big problem. Nobody can figure out how the brain has all that data in it. Yeah, there's a lot of neurons and yeah, little things running around, but that's just a big mystery how the brain does all that. Brain doesn't store anything. The brain doesn't process anything. The brain doesn't control anything. The brain's just a virtual brain. Matter of fact, the brain is not even simulated in this big uh, server unless somebody cuts a head open. Then you have to simulate a brain, but then it's just, you know, it's a picture. It's what do you see? So when you think top down, you see your world changes completely. You know, and I know it's really strange to think that way because we all think, well, we're here and it's the brain and the brain tells me to do whatever it does and brain's in charge of the body. And we believe that. But what's in charge of the body is that the consciousness says, raise your right arm, that signal goes up to the server, and the server does this with this avatar in a computer, just like the elf tells the elf, run or raise your right arm. Elf, the elf does that, just like we do. Does the elf have a brain? Well, the elf makes decisions. The elf does all kinds of things. But if you split open an elf's head in the world of Warcraft, there'd have to be a brain inside. Right? Because otherwise, there'd be a problem. How does this elf do all this, you know, without a brain? Well, there'd be a problem. Because that wouldn't be consistent in the rule set. Because the rule set has some kind of physical causality inside that physical World of Warcraft set. And then there wouldn't be any physical causality, so now you've got a problem. You've created a paradox. You take a little particle and you smash them together, what's going to happen? You're going to see pieces. That doesn't mean that the system is modeling these pieces all the time in order to build this reality up from the ground up. You only see those pieces because somebody looked. And then you model those pieces and you're going, you don't have to model any of that stuff anymore. The system is not modeling molecules and atoms. It's not modeling particles. It's modeling virtual avatars that respond to the requests of the, or the, the orders, whatever you say, the, the direction of the consciousness. And we see it as this, you see. So brains, um, I guess the thing to see is the, the, the difference between you have the, the, uh, the free will awareness unit, that's the little c, little c consciousness, but it's a part of the big consciousness. And the individuated unit of consciousness is the accumulation function. And I don't know if I've said this yet, but I should, I should tell you that these labels that I'm giving things, free will awareness unit, individuated unit of consciousness, larger conscious system, these are all metaphors. Don't start thinking that, you know, that these are all piece parts. 
we think piece parts of a system because that's the, what we're used to doing here. That's the way this reality frame works. If I break this thing apart, there's piece parts in there. I can take all the parts together and I can uh, put, take them apart, put them all together again. So we just think that things have to work that way. They have to be piece parts. Well, this is consciousness. Remember I said that you get the data, you can observe the data, but you never actually see the source of the data. The source of the data is beyond your seeing. It's one of those things like with the intestinal bacteria, you just can't get to there from here because all you can get as consciousness is data. Your experience comes in a data stream. The creator of that data stream, you don't see because you're in a virtual reality and that's taking place in a different reality frame. It's just like the elf will never see the computer that's computing his reality, he just can't see that. We can't see the source of the data because we're in a virtual reality. We can say, well, can we get out of this virtual reality? And then look, if you were, in a vir if you were outside of the virtual reality, you wouldn't have any experience because there wouldn't be any rules for context of that experience. There's no rule that talks about senses or no rules that talks about even communications or anything else. There's just no rules in a virtual reality. What, do you what are you? You're nothing at all. You're a piece, you're data on a hard drive. You see, it's that virtual reality that gives context to your existence. It gives you something to do, something to interact with, something to experience. Without the virtual reality, there's no experience. That's why virtual realities are experiential. If you're experiencing, you're in a virtual reality. If you're not in a virtual reality, there is no experience. Well, if there's no experience, you're not conscious. You're just information without being conscious. You're potential information. And that's what you are in those databases. We talked about the past databases and the, and the probable future. You can go into those databases and explore them. But what you find there is just a data that represents that being. But it represents that being in every aspect of that being, emotions and feelings and knowledge and everything. So you can go in that and it's just like being there, like you're walking among them, right? And you can, you can get right in line and march with the other people there. And you can modify things. That modify things will give you a calculation of what that modification might have done, but it's not changing anything. You're not actually a part of a living history with beings that, are, that have a consciousness that are growing and evolving. They're acting out of probability. It's data. And part of their data is the probability of what they would do in any given situation. That's part of that data. So it seems real. It seems like that is, that is Uncle Fred. Seems like that's Uncle Fred. It looks like Uncle Fred. It smells like Uncle Fred. When you talk to him, it sounds like Uncle Fred. And when you ask him questions, he tells you the things that Uncle Fred would tell you. And you can ask Uncle Fred about current events. Say, hey, Uncle Fred, I know you've been dead for 10 years, but there's an election coming up. Who do you think I should vote for? And Uncle Fred can tell you, but it's probable what Uncle Fred would have said, given that question, you see, with Uncle Fred. It's probability. And you can, so you can talk about current events, and you'll get, a, you'll get something back about what Uncle Fred would say and why he would think that, because that's all part of Uncle Fred's database. So it's just information. This idea that, that there is no time, past, present, and future are all one thing and all happen at the same time is just silly. You know, it doesn't make any logical sense. You have to have time if you have change. You cannot have change without time. So if anything changes, if we can evolve, if we can think, if we can rationalize, if we can come to a conclusion, all that requires time, right? Because it, it's, it's, well, here it was before, and now it is after. If it's got a before and after state, time is defined by change. So you can't go back in time and then march with the Roman legions and still be there and it's all going on. It seems that way, like you're in that movie and it's interactive movie, but it's just a database. You can do that in the future. You can go in the future and actually interact through those probabilities and it looks like it's there. And you can interact with beings and you can do all sorts of things and you feel like you're walking around there, but it's just probability. 
All the action is here in the present. This is where the choices are made. That's why be here now, be present, you know, be authentic. It's because this is where the rubber meets the road, right here. Okay, so uh, uh, another misunderstanding is that the brain is some kind of a transducer, some kind of a link to the consciousness. All right, the brain runs the body, but there's this mystical link between the brain and consciousness. And it's some kind of like a radio receiver or something, transmitter, and we don't, of course, know how that works because it doesn't actually work, which is why we don't know, and we just can't quite figure it out. But that is a typical kind of a thought, that the brain is some kind of a transmitter thing. Again, these thoughts come from the concept that physical is fundamental, and everything else has to, has to be derived therefrom. So that's not really, really true. Um, you know, the brain tunes in, right? Tunes in things, right? I'm picking up your vibes. Yeah, what you're doing is you're picking up information. I see your aura. I can see your level of uh, spiritual development. I can see your health body. That's what we do when we're healing. You know, we call that a, a health body, uh, sometimes called the etheric body. And then there's the astral body, and I can see your emotions. And I can see all these things, but what is it? This is data from the database. And the output format is pictures and color schemes. And the color schemes are a default scheme, probably the one you read about in the book, because that's what you expect. Or do you just get a, a default if you don't expect anything? But you can change that color scheme. You can say, I want auras to be this way. I don't want zigzaggy red to be anger. I want you know, uh, zigzaggy green to be anger. Well, from then on, the auras you see, that zigzaggy green means anger, because you get to specify the output format. It's really a nice database that lets you do that. You see. So that's it. But we, because we see auras around people, now we think there's something around those people. You know, it comes, it's their bioenergy that comes out of their body because the body's fundamental. And that's what we're seeing. And then people will take Carolian photographs and they'll go measure electric fields around the body and all this, you get real excited about that. Sure, there's electric fields. This is an electromechanical device, right? There's a little electrical impulse zinging all around this body. It's how it works according to the rule set. And anytime you move charge, you create fields. And yeah, you're gonna measure all that stuff, but it doesn't have anything to do with ORs. ORs are information it's about your health, about your emotions, about your uh, spirituality or anything else you want, you know? If you want something else other than health, emotions, and spirituality, well, you can get that too. You just need to name it and give it an output format. And there it is. And you find out that you don't need to look at a person to see their aura. You can look at a picture and see their aura. And then you don't need the picture to see their aura. All you need to do is bring them up in your mind and intend to see it, and there it is. And they don't have to be in the room. They can be on another planet. They can be you know, on the other side of the globe doesn't matter. And you can send healing energy to them and they can be on the other side of the globe and that doesn't matter either. It's not about space. All the actions taking place in consciousness between you, consciousness, and the consciousness computer. All the rest of the space thing is irrelevant. Okay, so brains don't really do much and they're hardly ever rendered unless somebody has an operation or a bad accident. And then they're only rendered until that gets cleaned up. So that's the thing about brains. All right, this is coming to the end. And we're going to uh, then do lunch, and then we're going to do more experiential exercises. And the last slide is the value of a theory. Right? It supports current scientific beliefs. Yeah, not. Right? That's not the value of a theory. In the real world, and as a fact, the value of a theory actually is to support current scientific beliefs. That's the way it works, but that's not really the way it should work. The value of a theory is if it answers questions. How well does it connect the dots? How well does it give explanations, rational, logical explanations to your experience, to the things you Fine. Now, that's hard 
science experience of how long does it take this ball to hit the ground, that's an experience. It'll, it'll tell you that and also that out-of-body experience you had. It'll explain that as well. So explain what's known. It, uh, the fewer the assumptions, the better. It explains what's unknown and it makes sense of what is now paradoxical or mysterious. And I got a whole list of stuff in there, stuff that's now paradoxical and mysterious that uh, gets cleared up. And it has to provide new insights and predict new information. It's got to be able to see ahead and say, well, you know, if you looked at the average of the ensemble of these 10,000 data, then it would change the way you could do this in a predictable way. And then you can do the experiment and see if that Let's see if that works. So it uh, you know, explains what Lao Tzu and the Buddha were talking about, why some people are happy and some people aren't, right and wrong, what's important, what's not, where you should focus, why you're here, a lot of those things besides why the, how the double slit experiment works and why reverse causality isn't actually reverse causality and why it is that we do have free will and other sorts of things. So at the end of all of this, what I'd like to leave you with is that I don't want you to believe any of this. I want you to have an open mind that some of what I said might be true, possibly. I want you to be skeptical. Maybe not, but go find out. Go Good experience. What does your personal experience tell you? Does this describe, does this give you uh, a context for your own personal subjective experience? Does it give you a context for your objective experience in the, in the world? Does it answer your questions? And where the answer is no, it doesn't really, that's probably because you don't have enough data. Go collect the data you need. And until you collect the data, stay skeptical, but open-minded, and think about it, because this has to be your trip, not mine. You can't grow up believing in my big toe. That's why I said, it's my big toe. Not because I'm so proud that I wrote it, but because it's my experience, not your experience. So you have to go make your own big toe. You have to come to these conclusions and you have to come to them at the being level. That's where all the real action takes place in growth. So that means you have to you know, get up and take part. You have to get up and work at it because as we said, there's a, there's a thousand ways to goof off and do nothing. There's a thousand ways to not get it right. And there's only a couple of ways to get it right. So you have to work at it. You've got to put effort in. If you don't put effort in, nothing happens. If it's all intellectual, nothing happens. So that's where I leave you. Not to be a believer. That just doesn't help you at all. But be a doer. Be a beer. Get in there and see what happens. And when you pay attention to what happens, pay attention to your choices. Pay attention to why do I do that? Why do I feel that way? Why did I say that? Why did I go there? Why am I upset? Ask the why. The why is looking at your intent. What was my intent here? And if the intent comes out that, well, I'm looking out for number one because nobody else is, then you need to work on that. If the intent is, well, that made me angry because you know, they did such and such instead of it made me angry because I choose, I choose that anger for these reasons, then you have problems to work on. Everybody has problems to work on. That's why we're here, right? So it's not like, oh, shame, I have problems to work on, I'm not perfect, you know? It's, we're here because we're not perfect, so we have problems to work on. And where do you start? That's daunting, because you, after a while, you go from this point that, I'm doing pretty good, I really don't have too many problems, and then you start digging into it, and it's, oh my God, everything I do is pushed by ego and fear, and I don't do anything that isn't ego and fear, where do I start? And then just start any place, doesn't matter. Start on something small and easy. Just start 
and start working on it. Because if you have an intent to succeed, if you have an intent to grow up, it'll come to you. The things, the lessons, the, the opportunities you need will just be there in front of you. All you have to do is reach out and take them. So you just need that intent. But if your intent is to you know, goof off and have fun and not think about it because that's a lot of trouble, then you know, that's what will happen too. So it's all up to you. I hope I've given you some different, some bigger picture so that you'll have a context of how to interpret the things that are happening. And when really strange things happen, instead of it just being a strange anomaly in life, it'll have some context to make sense to you. Oh, that's why that happened. I need to pay attention here, you see. That's, a, that's an important thing. And look at everything in your life as an opportunity. Everything's an opportunity. The bad stuff that happens to you is an opportunity. The good stuff that ha happens to you is an opportunity. And when you see everything as an opportunity rather than everything as a threat, then life gets a lot of fun. It gets to be challenging, but it gets to be fun. And how am I going to meet this opportunity? You see, and it's a very positive sort of thing. Instead of how am I going to deal with all these threats, all these things that are going wrong? I can't get anybody to do what I want. How can I do that? You see, it's the wrong approach. So that's it. Not, not believe in my big toe, but create your own and get out there and do it. Put the energy in. And if I've, con if I've succeeded in creating a spark to do that over this last couple of days, then I'm happy. Now we're going to have one. Today we're going to have more of the experiential, and tomorrow it's going to be almost all experiential. I'm going to talk a little about experiential stuff, and then we're going to do experiential stuff and talk about it, but we're done with the theory. We're done with explaining how reality works. We're done with you know, the nature of reality and virtue and that. We won't talk really about that much anymore. So this is kind of the wind up for the, for the theory and this is how the world works talk. Uh, I hope it's been useful. That's it, let's go have lunch. <laughs>